This is the second part of the notes for the enlightenment unit, or enlightenment part of the unit. And you're going to, to best use this, you're going to need to download the PowerPoint because it has a lot of links in it for the music that we're going to listen to because it's all about cultural changes. Um, so go ahead and do that so that way you can pause the video and listen to the music. You'll also notice on the notes handout that you either got off of Blackboard or you got in class that there aren't as many fill in the blank parts. Okay, this is for you to practice going through the PowerPoint and learning how to summarize what's on the PowerPoint and listening to what I say and add things that I say so that way you get a complete set of notes. Okay, that's a skill that you need to learn in order to succeed in college or taking notes in a business meeting later on in life. So, in the Enlightenment we have some cultural changes and we have the development of a new style of art which is called Baroque or becomes known as the Baroque period. It's from approximately 1600 to 1760 Okay, it's the period in the style featuring exaggerated grandeur in art, architecture, and music. Think about how, when you're writing this down, you can do abbreviations for things. So maybe A-R-C-H instead of architecture. Um, during this time period, we also see a renewed religious influence. During the Enlightenment, between the Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment, we saw some pe a lot of people becoming non-religious or doing more secular things with secular art, especially in the Renaissance. And so now we're starting to see painters paint more religious scenes, like the Adoration of the Magi by Rubens. Um, so you can see the religious theme because it's the three wise men coming to visit the baby Jesus in the manger, okay, um, with, the, with his mother Mary behind the little baby and the little cows and the camels in the background. You can also see the exaggerated grandeur through the clothing and the rich colors, through the column up in the upper left-hand corner with the fancy top, um, how, you know, they're using gold, they're all fancily dressed, things like that. So that's one example. Um, there are going to be four examples. Another example is a church altar where you can see the exaggerated columns and there's pediments and multiple types of marble and there's um, a statue up on top but then there's also the carvings in gold behind the altar and the painting um, everything's encrusted in gold the Estasi de Santa Teresa is um, another is the actual statue that's carved by a guy named Bernini um, but you can see in the place that it's set in it's different types of marble again uh, and think of how expensive marble is it took a lot of money to create and at the top there's carving above and then there's the gold rays of light going down onto the angel um, again another religious scene so think about the grandeur of that. And we also have a lot of dramatic architecture, like this is the building behind the Trevi Fountain in Rome, um, where, you know, you have not only just the fountain and all of the statues, but the building is very ornate with the little window caps and the little balconies for the window, and then there's the big crest up on top, and there's stuff carved in it, and even the dome above the main statue in the middle has carving on the inside. Um, so that's the very dramatic and grandeur part of it. Music is also changing from the Renaissance. Okay, um, Baroque music is going to expand the size, range, and complexity of instrumental performance. So instead of just having, you know, two violins, um, a cello, and that's it, you'll have, you know, two violins, a viola, a cellos, string basses, and bringing in the wind instruments as well, um, bringing in drums. They also start to use harmony. Okay, so there, someone is singing a different um, pitch in the background, so that way it's um, providing depth to the music. Opera is also going to become popular during this time. This is when Puccini is writing his music um, and his Italian operas that you hear in uh, Italian restaurants and places like that. Think of Olive Garden style music. So some composers that we have are Johann Sebastian Bach. He's one of our Baroque composers. You just need to know, his, know him as Bach. You don't have to write down his first name, but that's his full name. We also have two others, including George Frederick Handel, who writes a lot of uh, religious music, especially his most famous is the Messiah. And then Antonio Vivaldi, who is from Italy and writes uh, many quartets. And so what you should do is click on the links here that our um, symphony is playing. And we have an example for Bach, two examples for Handel. You should recognize the Messiah, it's the Hallelujah Chorus, um, which is being heard quite often at this time of year. And then Vivaldi, which is the summer of the Four Seasons, 
Um, you might want to try and f see the other four seasons. Spring is his most well-known. Um, so listen to these and see and write some descriptions in your notes about what you hear. Are they fast or slow? Are they complex or simple? Um, things like that. On the other side of that chart on your notes is the classical period. Okay, this comes after the Baroque period, 1750 to 1830. We are starting to emulate the ideas of classical Greece with an emphasis on order, symmetry, and hierarchy with cleaner, lighter, more simple styles. So you can see the togas in this example, the inspiration of a poet, and how you know they're wearing Greek clothing and they have the cherubs that were common in Greek art. Here are some other examples. Greece expiring, okay, talking about nationalism growing in Greece um, with the takeover of the Turks. And then liberty leading the people, and this is um, of the French Revolution. Obviously, they wouldn't wear togas during the French Revolution, but this woman happens to be wearing one. And one of the most famous artists, which it asks, is a guy named Eugene Delacroix. Okay, his name is down here, Eugene Delacroix. Okay, you don't really pronounce the X. And so he painted a self-portrait. We also see portraits coming out during this time. More people are painting portraits than ever before. Um, some more Greek influence can be seen in architecture. Okay, this is a door in the Czech Republic where you've got the columns on the side and the pediment on top. You also see it in this palace in Italy, okay, where people lived. This was someone's house, all right? And you've got all the Greek statues, and you've got the Greek columns, the simple Greek columns, not the crazy ones, the more elaborate ones like in the Baroque period, but the more simple ones. Some classical composers. Uh, Mozart is one of the most famous classical composers. Okay, He brings the whole idea to classical music, which now encompasses almost everything with just an orchestra. And our other classical composer is going to be Ludwig von Beethoven. Okay, and that should be an O. It's a von, he's not a van. So he's our classical composer. So what you should do is click to this in the PowerPoint. And what does classical music sound like? Listen to some Mozart piano concertos and Beethoven Moonlight Sonata in the Fifth Symphony and write down what you hear. Okay, again, is it light? Is it heavy? Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it dark? Is it light? Is it um, complex or simple? Things like that. And then do a little comparison. After you've listened to these four songs, listen for like about a minute. You don't have to listen to the whole thing. Um, listen for about a minute and then see what is the difference between Baroque and classical music. How would you compare them? Maybe think of a Venn diagram. Okay, do they have any similarities or are they completely different? And then think about how did the ideals of the Enlightenment influence art? Okay, influence music, influence architecture, influence painting and things like that. Feel free to pause the video and write and then start it up again when you're ready. I'm gonna move on. Enlightenment literature is also changing. Previously, we had things like epics and novellas, which are tiny little short stories. Um, but we start to get new novels emerging, um, which is basically fiction emerging, where they have a narrative or a story. They have a plot. Um, there's full of suspense, and they start to explore the thoughts and feelings of characters, like, you know, a young woman falling in love with a boy and, like, a guy going on adventure, like in Don Quixote. Um, so Miguel Cervantes is one of the famous authors of the novels, okay? There's also Thomas Mallory who writes Le Morte de Arthur, which is the original story of King Arthur and the Round Table, and the Knights of the Round Table, like Sir Lancelot. So that's all changing during this time period as well. We also have, and this is flipping to the back side of your page, two enlightened monarchs who try to take the ideas of the Enlightenment and use them in their reign to make some reforms while not limiting their power. Okay, we've talked about Frederick before a little bit. We'll look at his reforms a little bit more in depth here. And we've talked about Catherine before as well. Frederick is going to be, we know he's from Prussia, he's going to reform Prussia. He institutes some religious freedoms thanks to his numerous communications with Voltaire. They write I don't know, 60 to 80 letters back and forth. Um, and Voltaire actually goes to Prussia, I believe. Um, and they have these discussions. And so Voltaire really influences Frederick the Great. 
They're going to improve the education system in Prussia. They're going to reform the justice system. Okay. Um, he becomes known as what is called the first servant of the state, which means the monarch exists to serve the state. So the big person serves the little people, not as opposed to the absolute monarch where the little people serve the big person. So that is Frederick. Now, Catherine the Great is from Russia. Okay, she comes along after Peter the Great. And she's going, she's an absolute ruler, but she does try to reform things. She reads Voltaire, she reads Locke. She's a very well-read woman and tries to make some you know, changes. She's going to propose religious toleration, so accepting the Jews, because Russia is Orthodox, accepting Catholics. She's going to propose to abolish torture. However, Russia still has serfs, okay? Remember where people are tied, the peasants are tied to the land and cannot leave. And when the serfs revolt, she shuts down every idea of reform and says, nope, we're done, stop enough of that. If you're going to revolt, we're not doing anything for you. And so because of this, she becomes, she tries to become an enlightened monarch, and she succeeds in some parts, but she becomes much more of an absolute ruler in the end. Um, and she's also going to expand Russian territory to the point that it almost is today. So they go all the way across Asia, and not just the little area around Moscow where we saw Peter the Great being centered. So two questions I want you to think about. Why must all rulers balance their philosophical goals of reform with practical concerns about support? And who do they have to think about supporting? For example, if the serfs revolt, who is Catherine trying to get support from? From the peasants? Probably not. She, I don't think she cares about them to the extent that you would think. Or for the nobility. Maybe the nobility wants to have serfs, and so she's not going to end serfdom because of their revolt. So think about that. Also think about why are most of the reforms applied to the middle upper and upper classes? Why, how are they viewing the peasants and why do you think they view them like that? So pause the video and write for a minute and then come back. We've got one more slide. Alright, some new technologies that are developed during, during this time are things like all-weather roads, which are going to improve trade and transport. If your carriage is go not going to get stuck, you're going to be able to travel faster. If your wagon can actually go without breaking an axle from the rough road or breaking a wheel, then you're going to have faster transport and get your goods to market even faster. We're going to have a lot of new farm tools during this time period. We'll see um, it increasing productivity. We'll see looms being created to help factories. Um, we'll see steam being used to work on factory electricity. Things like that all increasing productivity and making more money. Um, we also see new ship designs, which means that ships can travel faster, okay? Rather than the old ships that you think about with, like, the Spanish Armada or Christopher Columbus, these ships are able to travel faster, and we'll start to see some of them being used in America to get people to California for the gold rush. Those are called clipper ships, and they move much faster than the ship in the picture. Um, but this is also helping trade between, you know, Venice and the Ottoman Empire, and between England and France, and between England and Spain. So these are all helping out. So those are some of the cultural changes overall during the Enlightenment period. And that's the end of the notes.